Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, um, I'm, for those of you who have been waiting, um, I'm so sorry. Um, for some reasons I'm having a few technical issues on my laptop, um, of all things. So I couldn't stream live, so I'm using my phone, <clears throat> which means that um, I don't have access to the slides that I prepared. Um, so I'm going to keep on trying to just access it on my laptop. I think there's some um, settings that are preventing that. Um, so forgive me if you see me twiddling around. So first of all, I'd just like to thank the 11 plus journey for allowing us this space. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you for mentioning that. So um, as I said before, hi, Deep. Um, I've just had some technical issues on my laptop, was working fine a few minutes ago. It's now not allowing me to live stream from my laptop, so I'm doing it from my phone. So um, bear with me, please, with the slides. I'm going to try to keep on connecting um, to my laptop because it will be a much better presentation. Anyway, today is just to give you an opportunity and thankfully for the 11 plus journey, um, um, yeah, I'm going to try rebooting, um, Sheena. I've been trying to do that, so I'm going to switch off my laptop completely and just try and see if it will start again. It's just freezing every time. Anyway, so I will get going in this time anyway, give people a chance to join. And um, my disclaimer, I'm going to keep repeating that, is I don't profess to be an appeals expert. I don't have any legal background. I didn't pro, um, prepare cases for appeal. Um, my experience comes from the five years that I sat on the education appeals panel as a volunteer independent member um, for Croydon Local Authority. Um, so I'm going to just be sharing my experience as a panelist, um, looking at the cases that were presented, the kind of arguments that people base their um, cases around, those that were upheld and those were, that were not, um, that were unsuccessful. All right. And from that, um, generally most of the questions um, I get, I'll be able to, from my experience, give some information or give some guidance about. Anything that I am not able to answer, I'll be able to, um, I'll point you in the direction of somebody with a bit more expertise that can perhaps look into your case. So anything that I'm not able to answer, I'll be quite frank with you about, um, but that doesn't mean that I'm making any judgment on your case, okay? All right, what I'm going to ask you to do is please feel free to send in messages and let me know what your scenarios are. I'm going to be using, I had some slides, so I'm just going to close down my laptop and start again. I had some slides that I wanted to use, which just had bullet point outlines of um, the appeals process, really, and the kind of things that um, we can bring to appeal. Um, and um, for anybody that attends to do, I can certainly make those um, slides available after um, if I'm not able to log on from my um, laptop, okay? So I'd encourage you again, if you have a scenario, put it in the chat and um, I'll take it from there in terms of giving you on the spot advice now about the things that you can do. Now, the first thing to acknowledge is that this is a very stressful time for parents and the children alike. It's a very stressful time. Um, and um, I understand that completely as a parent and um, as um, a tutor, as somebody just involved in education. Um, it's a arduous journey anyway, just going through the 11 plus process. Um, I've seen a lot of tears in my time and especially at panel. Um, it is the time where you are thinking about this being a major milestone in your child's life. And so everybody who you sit in front of the panel will hear you. They are there to hear you. So they may have the panel, how the panel's appeals process is um, organized. It's very different now and it changes over time. It's very different in terms of um, academies, which can have their own schools based panels that they're made up of or local authority um, schools, which will have the panel that, that I sat on, which will have an independent panel member like me who um, 
Although I worked as a teacher, um, I wasn't, um, it was a different borough, so there wasn't any conflict of interest in the schools that I was hearing about, and so I was considered as independent. But there would be other people like me who were just members of the community who wish to, um, who are interested in this sort of work and will sit on a panel to give advice and to make sure that it's independent and not biased as well. And on your panel, um, you will have somebody there who is, um, they'd have sometimes ex-head teachers so they will have an educational professional that is linked in some way to the borough um, or to the school that is there to give professional advice and guidance now your appeal is your right to appeal um, you have to lodge an appeal and there is a certain amount of time that you have to be able to do so so we've just had um, national offers day on opt i mean march the first and you have about, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it's about 20 days or so within to lodge the appeal. Now, if you, um, the earlier you get your appeal in doesn't make it, doesn't bolster your application, but you want to um, lodge an appeal sooner rather than later because the school will have, may have, quite a few appeals that they need to hear. And it will help the school to organise how, hi Agnes, it will um, help the school to organise how many they have and in what way they're going to administer the appeal. So some schools may decide and some authorities may be to have an open hearing, meaning that they don't hear your case um, in an open forum with others, but they certainly um, present the schools or their arguments to an open forum because that will be... Um, that would be relevant to all, okay? So it's quite generic information, it'll be relevant to all, okay? And then they will apply the on a basis um, condition as they hear each case. So they'll apply the school's position, the local authority's position um, against not upholding your appeal um, on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? So lodge your appeal, um, early or make a decision to lodge the appeal, you can always decide later on whether or not you want to go for the appeal. So put in that lodge um, and then start collating evidence. OK, now the big thing for um, an appeals process is it has to be evidence based. So as much as we can empathize with circumstantial or subjective information that you may present about your child's ability or circumstances, it is just that, it's quite subjective. And your any point that you make will be bolstered by hard and fast evidence. Now, I've had a number of people um, contact me with particular scenarios and I'll use that as the basis really to kind of present some kind of case study examples for which you could and what kind of evidence you would need to um, support that. So my slides would have been really useful right now, but I'm trying to retain it all. OK, so. Um, the two major areas that you can lodge your appeal on, there's roughly only two, and it's really on the grounds of whether or not the, there are mitigating circumstances, which we'll go into mitigating circumstances, extenuating circumstances, that perhaps have affected the child's performance or that they have met the required mark but they haven't got in and you're going to build your appeal around mitigating circumstances that should be considered, that you feel should be considered. Or there are indeed health or medical and social welfare reasons. Those are the two big categories um, that you can build an appeal around. Now, when it comes to um, medical reasons, so there could be an array of issues that you think medically the, ch the school needs to hear in which to consider your appeal. The difficulty with a medical is that it always comes back to evidence. So you have to be in a position where you have some evidence, so a medical letter of some sort, that lays out explicitly why one school 
why one particular school would help to address those medical needs of your child. And that is the difficulty that you might have on those medical grounds because you need to get a doctor or a medical professional to, um, to state that that particular school would be um, the most appropriate to meet the medical needs or to help to alleviate the medical needs of your child. That school, in, by, by your child going to that school, your medical needs would somehow be alleviated and that that it would be a detriment for your child to go somewhere else. Now, in the appeal, you really only want to focus on the school that you're appealing for. So my reference to if your child went somewhere else, that would be detrimental. That's just an aside. But you do not want to spend the time in your appeal talking about why the other school isn't good for her or him. You want to really use your appeal to appeal to the admission of your child at that particular school. So base your arguments on why that school meets your child's needs best of all. Okay, so yes, the question deep, would you need a medical certificate to prove that a child was unwell? Absolutely. Um, you just saying that your child was unwell on the day or that there were some issues medically affecting the child that, that contributed to the child's performance on the day of the 11 plus um, won't, they it won't be believed. Okay, so it has to be evidence. And so you have to have some kind of doctor's letter or something that can prove that what you're saying is in fact what happened. Okay, so on the grounds of medical, there can be a quite an array of medical grounds as to why you feel the child needs to go there. But any reason, any basis has to be backed up by a medical letter to suggest that. And the difficulty would be getting a medical professional to name a school. Yeah. OK, to name why the child has to go to that particular school. OK, so medical reasons. Generally, people who have medical issues, um, they would usually have they would usually have strong grounds because they've got a wealth of variety, a portfolio of evidence and the school. But you just need to match it to that argument of why that school then is going to be able to um, alleviate some of those medical concerns. So an argument can be built around that. So social welfare. If you have a social worker, so I can see your question, Kalsim. Distance, I'll come to that in, the moment, in a moment. Um, so social welfare, if your child has a social worker, then of course there are strong grounds, okay? And the school would be pretty shaky as to why that hasn't been offered because you would have quite a lot of evidence about um, the needs of the, the child um, and the vulnerabilities of that child, which would again would have to be proven. Um, so I'm going to come back to social welfare in a moment because there's just a few questions coming up. So, um, Saba, Claire, about why the school you prefer is more important than the reasons why the school you have been given a place. Yes. So your argument needs to be focused on the appeal for the school. That is your focus, the school that you want. The appeal shouldn't be denigrating the school that you have been offered. OK, so don't spend your time talking about why that school isn't fit for your child. The panel is not there to agree with another school that you don't want. What they're there to consider is your reasons for appeal for the school that you want. So just spend your time making your argument and your evidence around that particular school. That's all that they will focus on. So we've got a question coming on. What about when you're fighting for a place on distance? OK, um, right. And another pupil premium. OK, so I'll add those. OK, so when you are looking for a place, fighting for a place on distance, so a lot of people fall into this. So out of catchment. Um, or it might be, there's a few different scenarios. So if you're fighting for a place on distance, um, then we, then really what you're going into is the oversubscription criteria. So you need to look at what the oversubscription criteria is 
on the school's admissions code and to see whether or not that has been applied um, appropriately. So if you can prove that the school has made an error applying the school's the admissions code, then you win an appeal. Your ap appeal will be upheld. If there is any error made in applying the admissions code, then you have a strong case and one that is likely to be up upheld. However, you need to be able to prove that there's been an error in that, in that um, process. Okay, so an error in the process in applying could be that one of the um, inquiries I had um, in the last couple of days was that a parent felt that there were um, applicants or other children who had got into the school or been offered a place that lived further away from where this parent lived. And if that is the case, if that is a fact, and also that that parent had moved into the catchment area within the required time, but that parent doesn't believe that the local authority has the right address for the parent. Now, if that is indeed the, the case, you have strong grounds to query that. You, of course, have to um, um, attach all your email trail, all the contact that you've made to the local authority, the submissions that you have made when you've put in um, the um, your put in your application and um, sent in the information that we've moved into this address now. We've made it all of the evidence that you have. You hopefully have an electronic trail of communication, and all that communication needs to be. Um, needs to be evidence. So bring all of that, send that in with your appeal. So you want to submit all the evidence that you have with the appeal um, and then you can talk about it so that the appeal panelists can review the information before you sit before them. Now, if you bring evidence to the appeal, just be wary that the appeal members then haven't had the chance to really review that information. And although they're required to, they really haven't had the time to consider it seriously. Okay, so as much evidence as you can, as you can gather, gather that and put it logic with your appeal. Okay, so when we're fighting on distance, um, of course, you have to be able to evidence where you are, um, look at the oversubscription code and see whether or not there is anything that you think there's been an error in applying the, um, the catchment area or the distance to. The catchment area, so sometimes they'll have postcodes for, for different region, regions. The catchment area can shrink, believe it or not. So the amount of offers that they um, apply, that they give out in any one year can change from year to year. So, for instance, if we have a block of flats that have been built in, you know, between last year and this year and more children are living more closely to that school, then you'll find that the distance that they are offering children places to would shrink. So the catchment area, even where they give postcodes, sometimes is hard and fast and it really will depend on what's happening within the locality of the school in any given time okay so I'm just going is every school pupil premium child appeal on others Zara I'm not sure what that is asking is every school pupil premium child do you mean that is the question do um will they up will they um is a pupil premium place considered more um highly than a child that's not on pupil premium is that what you're saying zara i think that's probably what you're asking now in terms of the pupil premium then the schools generally have a percentage that they'll allocate to children who are on some on or have been previously on pupil premium so they'll have a percentage and that will differ from the school to school so what they will do is when they're looking at their admissions that when you are making your registration to apply in the first place 
for an 11 plus um, to sit the 11 plus exam you will have a form that you fill out and you do indicate on it whether or not your child has been a recipient of um, pupil premium your schools will let you know this and if you have it you indicate that on your application or the registration form at the time the panel the panelists are there to listen to every um, every um, argument that comes in front of them equally so the panelist is not going to differentiate between a family member who um, who is has a child on pupil premium and another who isn't. Okay, they are there to listen to the evidence of your arguments. Okay, and why that school is more suitable. So they're not going to just uphold an appeal because a child is on a pupil premium. Okay, I hope that answers your question. If you need more further clarification, Zara, please get in touch with me. Okay, so Vipul, what if we believe the admissions team have made an error in using the submitted address evidence? So Vipul, that just re goes, goes back to, I think, what I said a little bit earlier. Um, if you think that the, there has been an error in the admissions process, then, of course, you need to state what that error is. Of course, you need to state what that error is. Okay. And then you need to evidence that. So you need to have a paper trail or an electronic trail or lodging when phone calls were made, the names of the people that you spoke to. Um, and if you cannot see that the, the, the local authority has your... Um, you should have a form when you fill out that um, 11 plus form, your your CAF form on the CAF form itself. It should have um, a copy of all your personal details, the child's the applicant's details, the child, your address and so on. And as you go back and change that, if you make any changes, meaning to, into the address, you should get another version of that initial application and that version you'll literally have a version number so when you submit um, your application um, and you just submit it once you'll have version one if you go back and make any amendments to it that's another version you'll have version two and it'll be a different number as well application number so that should be an indication that you should have that actually what is the information that the um the schools, the local authority who are the admissions team hold on you. Now, I, my youngest child is 13. He goes to a grammar school and I went back into my e-admissions um, account just to check the information that's there. And all my information is still there in case I wanted to add a new, another child or I guess. Um, all my information is still there, including the my home details. So if you believe they've made an error, with the address, then your um, route is to go back to show when you submitted that information with the address on it. You should have something in front of you that will actually show you the address that they've used. Okay, so you should have an email or an electronic form that will have all your details on it. And if they've got uh, the wrong details, then of course that's grounds for that admissions um, code hasn't been applied properly. So there would be strong grounds for that. But of course, like I say, it depends on the evidence that you submit. Okay. Um, Shalu, non-qualification, didn't achieve the pass mark, unfortunately. Both grandparents passed away in May and September just be before the exam so a lot was going on sibling is at the same grammar school so I was hoping they'd be together not sure if it's worth appealing okay so the other thing that I would encourage is sometimes people just want to appeal for um, peace of mind to just know that they've tried all avenues and I'm not going to discourage that if it's something that you really want to do and just be heard um, sometimes it can just help with the process, okay? So that's a decision that you'll have to make. But in terms of he did a non-qualification, didn't quite get it, but you think that your extenuating circumstances are that there's been, um, sadly, and I, my condolences, sadly, grandparents passed away. I suspect, Shalu, that with the horrendous 2020 that we've had, 
um, with COVID um, and everything else, that unfortunately there is going to be a lot of people in your position who have lost loved ones. And of course, um, it, it's had an impact on the whole family, including the child taking an exam. It would affect anybody sitting at an exam. So whilst those are certainly extenuating circumstances, what you have to approve, what you have to try to evidence at an appeal is that there is a distinction between how the child has performed academically um, and that that can, that's academic performance has been consistent and of um, um, grammar school standard, I guess, capability, and th that there's a distinction where there's been a drop in that academic standard since then. So that's what you have to try to show. So you would have to gather evidence like any kind of academic, academia, academic assessments from the child's current school, um, where it consistently shows, uh, yes, school reports, where it consistently shows an outstanding or excellent academic standard. And then you can evidence that the standard has dropped only since these dreadful um, incidences have occurred in your life. That is some evidence there to show that, yes? So that is one way that will bolster what is otherwise quite a subjective um, argument to put forward. So although it is heart-wrenching and it is absolutely quite valid, you somehow need to be able to quantify how this thing, how these incidences have impacted on your child's ability to perform in the test, which I know is very, very difficult. Okay. How would you know that admissions has made a mistake in measuring distance? We don't know of anyone who has been offered but is further away. So how would you know that admissions has made a mistake in measuring your distance? Um, they have your address. Um, so, um, Kalsum, how would you know if they've made a so my so what I'm trying to clear up is if they have miscalculated where you are so they do it from um I think it's from as the crow flies as the crow flies so a straight line from the school to your address that's easily um well we can find that out we can find out what the address from your school from the school from the from the school to your address is um, I don't know how to measure that myself, but I know that you can find that out. Yeah, I think you can put in the GPS coordinates and you can find out the exact distance. So it is easy to check where you are from the school. And if the school is saying um, that you're outside of the catchment area because you're further away from that, then you what you have, the information you have is where the school's cutoff point is. And if you are within that or if you are outside of that. So the information you do have without having to look too far is the distance as the crow flies from the school to the furthest application applicant they've been offered a place. And remember this changes from year to year. So that's the difficulty because it can shrink. Okay. Um, they might have more applicants within um, concentrated closer to the school than in another year. OK, so you have what you already know is how far the school has offered a place in previous years. That doesn't mean that it's going to be the same for this year and where you are. And if you think there's been a mistake, then that's quite concrete. It's a concrete thing in terms of the distance where you are. So you should be able to find out, well, I'm at this distance. OK, but you've put me as out of catchments and out of catchments. Um, remains to this to X distance. Okay, I hope that's clear. It sounds in a little bit jumbled to me, but if it's unclear, please just let me know. I can't hear you any longer. Can everybody hear you? Me? Um, can anybody hear me? Can somebody just say if you hear me? Because I'm getting. Can you hear me, guys?
Yes, you can. Okay, fine. Okay, because I had a few from Gemma as well. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, how can schools give evidence when kids haven't been in school most of the year? Would they look at evidence going back to year four or five? Okay, so that's a good point, Shalu. Okay, this 2020 uh, has been an exceptional year. And that's why I do believe that it's well worth lodging an appeal, especially in terms of gathering evidence for academic assessments. They are going to look at a wider variety than they would have done. OK, so, of course, what we're looking for is a history of academic performance. And because children haven't been in school, although teachers still have been working and delivering classes and they will have some judgment on performance still, teachers will still have been able to judge engagement, although we know that engagement has been affected massively by lots of different reasons going on at home and technology and so on the schools will have um ad academic and professional judgments that they can make on your child's academic performance because they know your child best so they're in a stronger position to say what the likelihood likely outcome of your child is on um or likelihood is on a child, your child when they perform in a test. So yes, Shalu, they, the schools will have some evidence that they can use. And I suspect that this year, the evidence pool that they're going to accept from schools is going to be wider than it was before because of schools not being, not children not being at school, but to teachers still being professional and still being able to make academic um, judgments on assessments. Okay, great. Okay, so non-qualification, um, academic performance, gathering school reports. Right, so Nisha, you've put, our address was changed by either the school or local authority on the portal. The admissions team have our correct address, but the portal was then changed. Okay, Nisha, so this sounds um, quite bizarre that on the portal your address is showing an incorrect address now if that is the case nisha then there seems to be an error in applying there would have been an error in applying the admissions code and so you absolutely would have grounds to have that queried so the portal if what you're saying is the portal is showing your incorrect address then we want to know how that happened OK, so we want to know that happened. So they have applied the admissions code to the address on the portal, which is the incorrect address. So the admission teams have our correct address, but the portal. Right. So Nisha, gather that evidence, take a screenshot. If it's on the portal, then it's something that can be seen by the local authority by yourself. OK, and you want to we're going to have to find out how that um, how that discrepancy has arisen, whether or not you've inputted incorrect information or has there something at the back office that's happened or some administrative error? If it is an administrative error, then you do have grounds for appeal because that is a clear um, error in the system. OK, um, let's just see what else we've got here. Yes, so the independent schools deep yet yeah, did contact the primary school for an academic reference this year. Yeah, absolutely. Schools are still working. Um, processes are still going on, so don't give up hope in your schools. Your schools, your school, your children's primary schools um, will be able to give a professional and sound academic judgment, which is usually held in high regard because they're professionals and we regard that um, these professionals know your child best and give a true and fair um, offering about your child. Okay. So Nisha, we have three girls and the youngest is at a local school and her address has been changed, but she would not have got a place locally on the old address. Um, we have three girls and the youngest is at a local school. Right, OK. And her address, but she would not. Right, OK. So I see what you're saying, Nisha. So you seem to be saying that the address on the portal. Um, so on one of the addresses proves that that's where you live because one of your children have been offered a school 
place based on the locality. So she meets the catchment criteria for that school. So it seems based on that. Okay, so what we don't know is how far that um, catchment expands to. We don't know how far that catchment expands to. So we're not sure if you can use that as part of part of your evidence. Let's see, so addresses have been changed for all three children. Okay, so Nisha, this sounds quite complicated. If there has been a change um, at all, then there's been an error somewhere. So what I would say is just um, take screenshots um, of that, put it in with your appeal, and you're appealing on the grounds that there's been an error applying the admissions code, all right? And then it's for the panelists to look at the evidence that they have in front of them. If you submit it before your hearing, then they will have a chance to go and look at the portal, to just go and look at the information that was supplied and see whether or not um, this indeed has been done, if there's been an error in the system. Right, so the catchment for the young girls 0.3 miles and our old address was 15 miles and you think that they've used your old address, okay? So do as I say in terms of just making sure that you have that the portal and the admissions authority have two separate addresses um, and then lodge your appeal on that basis because there is a discrepancy there, okay? That's what I would say. Okay, Kathleen, any templates available for writing an appeal letter? I can provide you with a vague template depending on the basis around which your appeal is to be made, okay? Um, any templates for writing... Right, let's see what Sabah is saying. Okay. Right. So definitely, yes. Um, templates for writing an appeal, I can get out to the people who in this live. What I'll do is I'll ask um, the admin um, of 11 plus journey if I can, I'll up upload that to the file section if that's where admin wants it and then anybody who wants to use that um, it will have access to it okay so I'll let the admin decide about accessibility arrangements but I'm happy to upload that to the file section of this group it won't be immediately after this live because I, I'm a bit busy but certainly um, by later on today okay so um Right, so Nisha, you're saying, sorry for us, they thought we would go back to our old address, but there was no evidence for this. Okay, so I'm not clear what that means. Okay, right, okay. Um, they would go back to our, I'm not sure. So Nisha, it just sounds like, depending on the address that you are, that is what needs to be verified, okay? So I'm not sure about the, the local authority thinking about what, where, what address you were going to, but um, just clarify the address, the address that they have to um, apply the school's admissions code to you. Okay, so Shalu, the 11 plus exam was taken over a week, not one day. There were parents who had concerns that some children, okay, that some concerns that some children were leaked, so children could set the exam earlier in the week, may have had chances jeopardized because some children knew that was in the exams, okay. Okay, so um, I kind of swallowed up a little bit of what Shalu was saying there. But Shalu is saying that, okay, so not strictly appeals, but what you're asking is that because the exams, I'm assuming because of COVID, the exams were stretched out over a longer period than they normally would have done. So usually it would have been a day um, and that, that some places had it a week. And you're saying, you're asking whether or not this jeopardized your child's performance. So this is new. It's a new scenario. The only thing that we can compare it to at the moment is that in previous years, you will always have a second sitting, another date for children who are ill on the day of the exam. All right. So there will always actually be a later date for children to sit the exam with actually um, credible reasons why they have to sit it. And the school will believe that actually this, these children are not prejudiced in any way because of children prior. Now, this is a system that has been in, um, in situ for many years. 
Um, and it hasn't been proven to be a disadvantage to the children who sit later. Or actually what you're saying is that it's advantageous to those children who sit later on because you would have had parents or other children talking about what's on the exam paper. It hasn't been, um, there's no precedent for that argument. There's no precedent for saying that all the children who sat um, 11 plus papers after the official date it was um, um, that that it was set out had had an advantage for that so that is the closest thing to what's going to happen this year in terms of the leaking of um, questions on the exam and therefore giving those children who sat it later um, an unfair advantage now that's I suspect is going to come up a lot this year, but that is going to be a new scenario for panelists to consider. And I think it's worthy of consideration, but your position as an appellant would be that you need to evidence somehow that this is the case. So either that you can gather some evidence where actually um, questions or that the exam for the children who were sitting it late has been marred by questions leaking. You know this to be a fact. You know this to be true. Okay. Um, and that this therefore can um, prejudice the exam. You're going to have to find some kind of evidence. Otherwise, what you're going to do is put this at forward as something for the panel to consider. But there's no evidence that what you think might have happened has happened. So the, the panel aren't going to ruse that um, evidence for you they are going to be considering that actually the school's process is robust enough to um, accommodate late sitters as it has done in the past okay now what I'm not saying to you is that big it being that there were so many schools who had this process this year where it was um, stretched over a few days that actually um, there weren't glitches in the system. I don't know that. There could very well be. So it's worth putting your argument forward and seeing. Okay. Um, right. Um, Nisha, they decided that once she, she was in, we would move back. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me just go over some of some of the questions that we've had. Some of the questions, um, so mostly what comes in front of panels, mostly what comes in front of panels are um, social effects on your child. So people will um, argue that this is the best school for their child because they really want to go there. Um, they've got an interest and that's the school that's going to help their child to achieve the most academically Again, any of these reasons are subjective. It's not evidence-based. And so you have to quantify really why that is the best school. So if, for instance, your child has um, a significant, you know, quite academic evidence, of course, will be able to draw a picture of your child being academically um, suitable for that particular school but then also what you have to evidence you have to argue is on that oversubscription because there are lots of children who are deemed um, academically illegible but because there are just so many children there's not enough places there to offer and so what you're really fighting on is the oversubscription criteria and what you're trying to argue with the school is that allowing my child to have a place and take your school or that class over the um, published admissions amount um, number is not going to prejudice the school in any way and the school will come back or the admission authority will come back and say well actually these are our reasons now the schools i don't know yet but the schools because in light of social distancing and covid requirements might actually have significant grounds for not oversubscribing this year because they're having to find extra space in the school to accommodate the actual um, published admission number or the net capacity. 
all right? So that space in the school um, has to be used up more so than it would have been used up um, in previous years. So your oversubscription around why it's not going to prejudice the school in any way has to be quite significant. Um, and it has to be based on, um, of course, the students' suitability for the school. Um, and of course, um, things like um, medical, where it's evidenced um, as needing that school to be most um, suitable. Um, you can put in arguments around um, distance to traveling if you've been allocated a school that is quite far away and is going to be quite inconvenient and in fact detrimental to your child um, to be traveling such a distance to the school that you have um, been allocated, then you need some evidence to show how that's going to impact Saying things like, well, it's just far, it, it's not enough. It has to be that it's going to impact the learning in some way. And that can be bolstered by that maybe the learning, um, special learning teams in school, learning support teams in school. OK, anything that has some professional judgment to bolster what you're saying is what you want to give you the greatest chance um, for having your uh, appeal upheld. OK, I had a question about um, trying to apply for a school that was initially not on your list. You can do this once you have obviously met selective eligibility. Um, so you've met. Um, OK, before I go on to deep, far would be considered, I think, if the journey takes 75 minutes is what the official guideline is if your journey is going to take you 75 minutes and I'm not talking about a short distance that's been delayed by roadworks you know we're talking about significant travel here that takes 75 minutes um, as a parent you can definitely make that decision to have your child travel more than 75 minutes I know people who go much further than that but the schools would judge that as too far okay so if you're um the schools would judge that as too far so of course if you can make the argument that you've put them such um quite a distance away then you do have grounds okay okay so what was i saying so right okay i've forgotten what i was saying there this is what happens when you don't have slides to follow. OK, so if your child, um, if you're trying to build an argument about why your child has to go to a particular school, one of the reasons as well, if you don't have medical and it's all to do with social welfare and it's something like bullying. So if your child had a very a dreadful time at their primary school. And that primary school is, say, for instance, like my children's school was a feeder to the local secondary school. And if you know that the majority of the cohort will be at that school that the child has been offered, then they're actually very credible grounds for deeming your school um, as a particular school as the school that you need your child to go to that will not be a detriment to their social welfare and their mental welfare. So anything terrible that has happened to your child and you can show that actually being in a this environment will be conducive to them thriving um, because it has impact significantly on them in the past, then um, yes, that does bolster your argument. Um, but of course, you would have to ha have to have had evidence of the horrendous experience that they had experienced prior and the needs to be in somewhere that will provide something more holistic and um, um, nurturing for them. Right, so applying for schools that you did not put on your list but can see from scores. Yes, so Gemma, so yes, if you have, you can appeal for a school that you haven't previously applied for, all right? So you can do that because it comes under the kind of in admissions, in year admissions. Um, so you are putting it, um, you are applying for them, even though, and you're appealing for them, even though you hadn't initially um, applied. Um, and a lots of people fall into this category, actually, people who are probably just moved into the catchment late and so on and so forth. OK. All right. And then they're applying for a place and they're going to appeal. So that shouldn't disadvantage you, believe it or not, because if you have met the qualifying score and got a qualifying mark and you're deemed of selective eligibility. All right. Then you will actually be considered 
in the cohort of those that are deemed selective, that those who are deemed eligible for a selective place, all right? And then what you have to do is obviously evidence why that school should consider or uphold your appeal, okay, um, because of the evidence that you've brought there. So, so your case is, don't worry about the fact that you hadn't applied for it before. Your argument in your appeal is, well, why is this school suitable for my child? That's the only consideration, okay? It's not going to disadvantage you, okay? So if a school has 180 places and these have all been allocated, how do they make space for people that appeal? So um, you have the net capacity of the school, which is um, usually more than the PAN, the um, published um, ad admission number. Um, Sometimes the schools can't, the classes can go over the um, recommended class sizes. Um, what happens in that instance is that um, the school arguments are deemed weaker than the appellant's argument. All right. So they might be successful appeals. So you could have in a year the 180 places being um, stretched because there might be a local authority child in care who has been able to get a place. So look at the admissions criteria. There might be appeals that have been upheld over the past. So the number itself doesn't um doesn't mean that no appeal will be successful once they've given out those offers you can still lodge an appeal and you can still be successful in appeal and the the um appeal can take the school over their published admissions number it, it can okay so don't let this put you off um they've got the places what you have to evidence what you have to argue is that your placement your the the place that your child is offered will not prejudice the schools so the school are going to say things like well we don't have enough teachers or we don't have enough tas we can't accommodate your child's learning um yes um the budget cuts um provision of learning okay so, um, and you have to counter argument that you have to say, you know, you'll have to evidence that actually this is the best place for your school and having one other person isn't going to prejudice the school in any way. Okay. So again, in terms of specific advice, this um, evidence, the evidence is going to be based on what your presenting arguments are. So if it's just my child met the eligibility criteria but i you know but i haven't been offered a place then the argument is around that you've met the place but you've not you you've met the eligibility requirement but you've not been offered the place so that 180 allocation deep is going to be in conjunction with what the basis of your a appeal is um centered around okay it's in conjunction with that because your appeal is based on what your argument is it's like when i'm um encouraging my um showing my key stage two how to construct an argument and the first thing you have to think about well where what is your position from what point are you then um pinpointing your arguments and creating evidence from from what point okay so it'll be dependent on that but yes that 180 can be stretched above for special circumstances of course which can be those in appeal in admissions maybe the local authority have had to take transfers from other local authorities it could be a myriad of things okay so you go and you look over up the oversubscription criteria and see how they um see how they apply what is in their oversubscription because those are the grounds that you'd be fighting on okay all right so um if we have don't have any more questions well do we don't have any more questions i don't think um, I have um, suggested that people can um, post their scenarios. We've done this talk, but you can you can put up um, scenarios. I know Sabah's welcoming being able to just um, respond to as many um, inquiries as we have. You can make those anonymous and we'll try to um, respond to it. I'm certainly... Yes, argumentative and persuasive writing. That's exactly what it takes me to, Saba. And I was doing that this week with my um, year fives. Yes, yeah, so argumentative and persuasive writing. If you're a little bit shaky, go to your year fives. 
go to those children you're making appeals on because I guarantee you they'll know how to structure that the, um, your argument there and then just use that as your skeleton for your conversation when you go in okay try to be prepared it can be quite a daunting environment to go in. You are approaching a panel of people you don't know. You feel you're up against an organization. Um, but I just want to empower you to, it is your right to appeal. You can appeal. It is your right to be heard. There are some bases which, of course, will bolster your appeal. I hope this um, live has helped to give you an idea of the kinds of things that bolster it. The idea that you have to get evidence. It isn't, nobody's going to just accept your word. As empathetic as they may be, you have to bolster it. Deep, my child would always win an argument, so would mine, absolutely, okay? So if there's been any pandemic issues, family difficulties, a number of people have said, oh, because of COVID, X, Y, and Z has happened. Absolutely it has. I uh, suspect that this year you might have, different, depending on the region that you're in, because the appeals panel does vary so much in terms of which panels that you're sitting in front of and how strictly it's applied and how um, open they are to um, going over that subscription. So it really depends. And that's why take your chances, but go in with a clear, robust argument that is evidence based. And if there is anything in your argument that you think, well, how can I prove this? And you ask yourself, well, where's my proof? So what? just like when you're doing um, a point evidence um explanation paragraph and you make a point but you can't evidence it you can't back it up look through what you have put together and ask yourself was well, where's my evidence for this what evidence can i get to show that the pandemic has actually had an impact in my child's performance so if they haven't performed they haven't got up to that mark but they otherwise are at an academic selectability selective a child um, status, then usually the academic performance shows that, then evidence that. Get all the school reports, get all your evidence and go in armed and show, here you go, there's a marked difference between how my child was achieving pre-pandemic, um, okay, and then when they sat the 11 plus, there's a marked difference and the history shows that. That is a strong, it's a clear argument, okay? I'm not saying it's going to win your appeal, but it's an example of when you go in and you make arguments, you don't want the argument to just be subjective, to just be based on what you think about your child. You want a professional's opinion to back that up. Any head teacher statements, any kind of school's assessment that they've done, don't worry about the assessment lacking in, because of the pandemic. Um, schools still have a material which they can assess children on. They still know what your child is like and they can see whether or not there's been a dip. OK, so the schools are best place and those contributions from the school are regarded highly. OK, so get it, get that information. So. Any medical professionals involved, bolster your point with your evidence. Social workers, if you've had child and adult mental health um, professionals in, involved, you might feel sensitive about sharing this information, but actually it's going to bolster your um, arguments, okay? So put them forward. Um, put them forward. If you're out of um, catchment, go forward anyway, based on what it is. Okay. Um, on a, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Sabah, for the opportunity to just help because what I wanted to do was just help. I understand how heart wrenching it is and how you can feel that all is lost, but it's not all lost. And I just want to encourage you to go ahead with your appeal, give it a try, put your appeal, format it in the best, strongest, um, way, um, that will be heard. And um, if there are any other questions, please log it in the group. And I'm going to try and dedicate some time to spend some time to answer any kind of scenarios that come up. Um, you can do anonymous posts in, to Sabah and Sabah will get um, the answers out. 
and I hope that I've helped to just clarify some points for you. Yes, I will be, um, the slides, I'll put up the slides and the template. It won't be right now, guys. I've got a busy day ahead. It won't be right now. But what I will do is as soon as I have uploaded them, then I'll put a little notification or Sabah will let everybody know in the group that they're there and hopefully they'll help. And if there's any further questions, don't give up. Go in armoured. Go in armoured and be encouraged and um, just give it a shot. It's worth a shot and at least you can say, well, I've tried, okay? And this is a fabulous group for support. Um, I wanna thank Saba and all the admin who are doing a fabulous job just to give parents this platform. I so wish I had this when my children were going through the process, um, but come back to the group for support. It's a great one, I'm sure you'll agree. Okay, I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody now. OK, and um, any quite further queries, just get them in on the group and we'll do our best to answer. OK, thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. It's been a real pleasure.